um, all of my logins are shared with her. Like, so um, I have to remember, wait, not Rylan, it's S Rylan. <laughs> Which department did your wife work in? She works in HR. Okay. Um, so if you didn't go look for a, a job on campus, she'd be who could, who yeah. could help you out. Although I, I don't think she was saying last night that she, we don't have a ton of part-time temporary jobs right now. Um, but if you were looking for something more long-term, this applies to, to all three of you. Um, if you want work on campus for whatever reason, um, yes, we don't pay all that much. Um, however, it's really convenient to work in a place that you also go to school because there's no travel time and that, and we'll work around your schedule and things like that. Um, and to the extent that if you, if you need to not work so that you can go study some departments will actually let you study and work on and work on assignments on the clock if you have stuff to do. Um, and some departments will just say, you know, don't come in today, go do your thing. So if you want the flexibility and the convenience of working at the same place where you where you study, um, you could do a lot worse. And and any of the departments on campus would be happy with any of the three of you in terms of of your work ethic and how quickly you catch on. Um, they're always looking for people that can catch on quickly. So if that's something that you're into, go talk to my wife in HR, Laura. Her name's Laura. Laura, yeah. Okay, thank you. Or look online. You don't have to go in person. Um, going in person is really nice. It it is at a small school like this to be able to like actually get that personal touch. Yeah. Um, it's just one of those things that like if, if I actually have to call, pick up a phone and call somebody, I will put it off for somebody else. Yes. <laughs> but, um, but if I can check it online and take care of it right away. Right, yeah. Um, all right, where are we? Week five. I'm kind of curious what it does say. Practices. Um, Let me go back to my other. This the one? Yeah. Okay. I could see you could do like one elimination, but then there's not a hydrogen to do that. The other one. Um, no, but you could pull it. Remember, you're not pulling a hydrogen off of here. Right. Oh, okay, yeah. You can pull a hydrogen off of of anything adjacent, really. Sure. Um, so, and and it will go through. Remember that this is a brute force. That sodium amide is really a brute force sort of reagent. So form the terminal. It'll form the terminal, and in this case, like oh well, wait, which where is it going to put the terminal? It usually will go towards the closest. And, but in this case, because it's methyl butane, um, it's going to be making, you, let's see, we can't really do a double, it would just go to the opposite end of the molecule. Because we don't have, like you said, you can't have two methyl one butyne because you can't have five bonds to a carbon, right? So in this case, it would go the opposite direction. And you'd wind up making after step one, you'd wind up uh, making now this is the part we're having two separate screens. You should just open this in PowerPoint for the sake of doing this. Um, we'd wind up putting the methyl at the opposite end. We'd wind up moving either with the methyl either being moved, more likely it's more like the pi bonds would wind up over on this end. Um, and I'll try not to ask you tricky questions like that. That wasn't the intention here, especially on the on the test. Um, but realistically speaking, since you can't put an alkyne there without breaking off an entire carbon um, and saying problem here, 
you'd wind up putting the alkyne here. So the the base, that strong base would like pull those pi bonds over that end. Right. Bonds. Basically, yeah. There's there's it's downhill in energy enough that to cause it to do um, multiple rearrangements in a row. It's just moving hydrogens. Really. And it would just be moving hydrogens. Um, so why would this go to the left instead of the right? Because you can't have if you put it yeah. if you try to put an alkyne here, you'd have five bonds on that carbon. That's what I was like banging my head against the wall about. Yeah. <laughs> so in that case, since we know that this is going to try and do a double elimination, it can't do the double elimination here or here. So the only way it can do that is expect and then to have a proton that it can pull off would be if the alkyne went there. But again, that the way that I make these these um, tests a lot of times, especially the practice tests, is I'll just mix and match. I'll cut up the old um, reactions and put them mix up the reagents. Um, and so I'm guessing when I when I was writing this, I was not intending to make it that tricky. I was just like, oh, I'll grab this one. This one can do a double elimination without thinking about it. That I was making it really tricky on you. Um, more of what I would do. If I was rewriting this question, I'd put both bro bromines here and here to make it really easy to see that it's going to go that direction. Yeah, that other group was throwing me in there. Yeah. Maybe number 10 would be good too. I've got an answer. I don't know if I was scribbling. I think it was the same thing where making sure it forms that terminal. Okay. Yeah, let me see. For whatever reason, it doesn't want to let me duplicate my display at this point, which is going to make it hard for me to, hard for the recording to show what we're talking about much. Uh, so just playing around with that for a second. All right. So for this one, for number 10, the trick is recognizing that that's not sodium amide. Oh, that's it. Okay. Yeah, that's the dissolving metal reaction. Right. Okay. Good. Um, which gives us partial hydrogenation, giving us the trans product. If the cis would do the um, Lindler's catalyst. Uh, hydrogenation. Exactly. If you wanted this is you do Lindler's. If you wanted to just be completely hydrogenated, just hydrogen and platinum. Okay. Just wind up. I'm just going to run PowerPoint and copy and paste stuff into PowerPoint um, for the sake of being able to get it on the recording and also take notes on it. So, and this is what I mean about how it's um, how I I tend to just cut and paste that same problem from from the old practice test was still an excess sodium amide problem, and then uh, in addition, but that one's a lot easier to see where the um to form the where that alkyne would actually form. All right, anything, what else is looking like you'd want to see the You wanna just use the time to, to work you three can work in a group on the practice problems and, and ask me questions. Um, do we want to do just practice synthesis problems? Kind of one of the two things that I had in mind was. The thing that I feel a is like the mechanisms on the um, al alkynes. It's like uh, oral hydration worked out pretty good. Mm -hmm. For the, for number one? Yeah. You would form the. Uh, you wind up making that enol and then doing the enol rearrangement. Right. Um, do we show like for that 
mechanism? Would we show the enol rearrangement? Um, ideally, yes. Okay. If you were feeling like you were under time pressure, though, and that would be, I would probably leave that one till the end. You just show like the alcohol goes to the right. If you, you don't goes to the alcohol. If you wanted to get, if you got to the enol first, that shows the bulk of the mechanism. And then if you had time to come back and show the enol tautomerization, that would be ideal. Um, because it doesn't really end at the enol, right? That is still technically an intermediate. Your final product will be the, the aldehyde. Um, You should we work through that one, or did you were you just looking for a little clarification on that part of it? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. okay, I have a good idea, but I'd like to feel more certain about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There we go. It's, I'm really struggling with this right now. Where did it go? Try to get used to be able to do technology on the fly. There we go. Sorry, it didn't look like anything changed to you, but I needed to get to the part where I could actually draw on it and have it show up. Um, and that wasn't working. All right, so our first step here, for all of these, the boro, um, the hydroboration reactions, we start with, um, basically adding your carbon in between the boron and the hydrogen. Um, we can't, we have that boron hydrogen bond and effectively what happens is you end up with one of the pairs of high electrons um, moving, moving towards the boron and the hydride moving towards the more substituted carbon. So we, our first step just looks something like this, and then you still have the R's, but we'll just, you know, they don't really do anything. So we get the boron to a carbon that then has still one more pi bond, one, two, three, four. We added the hydrogen over here. I think it's added to the um, more substituted one just because it takes up space. Because the boron is big and uh, yeah, it's basically and and that that intermediate winds up looking like um it's got carbocation character. Okay. And so you're gonna put the hydrogen on the, the more substituted carbon because that is gonna stabilize that a little bit more too. It's sterics, but it's also that that transition state character. Remember that Hammond postulate that the transition state looks kind of like what it started from, if that's where it's close in energy. Um, and so you're gonna wind up making that sort of partial positive um, character on the carbon. And it's more stable to have that on the secondary carbon than on the primary carbon. It's the hyperconjugation. Exactly. All right, so then once we're here, that is that is the hydroboration step. Then the next step is the um, oxidation part. Or it still has the other the boron has still the has the other parts. The other two R groups, but they're just not going to really react. And to avoid the other side having to draw all the possible combinations with the with the alkynes specifically, we're not just going to see BH3. It's pretty much always going to be R2BH so that you only have it happen once. 
yeah, with the repeating. right yeah. exactly with the alkenes because there's only one set of pi bonds to worry about it doesn't really matter because it's going to be the same molecule doing that process every time three times in a row here you could have some weirdness happening where an alkene reacted with the with the second for the second step on top of having the boron or the um, alkyne react the first time, it just gets too complicated to worry about. So we just do the R2 BH. Um, so we don't have to show the whole thing. Um, so then the second step is gonna be, you know, we are gonna have boron involved again eventually. And it's gonna, we're basically just gonna insert the oxygen in between the boron and the carbon. Um, but before we do that, we need to make that um, make that uh, peroxy per per hydroxide hydro peroxide ion. Um, basically, the, just the sodium hydroxide acting as a base and pulling a hydrogen off of hydrogen peroxide. So. Uh, hydroxide acts as a base, peroxide oxygen holds on to the electrons. To, so we make this O, O, H with a negative charge. And then, then we have sort of that complicated step um, where we, and I'm actually going to switch to, instead of drawing it by hand for this one, just since the stylus is not my friend today, um, and I want it to look nice and neat. Um, I'll pull up the um, the figure from the um, from the lecture slides. Actually, So it's going to look the same, and I think it's actually in just in the alkenes. I don't know if they show that step. So here's that first step that we just showed, except this is with the alkene rather than the alkyne. But we wind up making that intermediate. And it's this is the step that I wanted to make sure I showed clearly. So there's our deprotonate, the, the um, hydrogen peroxide, that peroxide ion, hydrogen peroxide ion, and then attach directly there and make that peroxide bond, or sorry, that oxygen boron bond. And then we just have the R group sort of slide over to the oxygen and kicks off a hydroxide. Yeah, that's because boron has a negative charge. And it's, it's, it happens because oxygen is more electronegative than, than boron or carbon. Boron, in this case, has the negative charge because it has four bonds. If you do the formal charge for boron, it's neutral with three bonds um, and no lone pair. If you give it four bonds, you actually get a negative charge to it. Um, and But because oxygen is so electronegative, it would much rather have a oxygen-carbon bond and an oxygen-boron bond. It's much more stable for the oxygen than an oxygen-oxygen bond where it has to share equally. So when the, um, the R group comes over, that just causes the other uh, hydroxide to, to leave from? Yeah, because once you still, we're still limited by by the octet rule for oxygen, right? right yeah. So you can't bring over the carbon electrons over to the oxygen unless you make room for it first. Yeah. But luckily hydroxide is a pretty decent leaving group. And so the hydroxide just leaves and takes its electrons with it. 
Um, and that's why we need the peroxide to begin with, is we need a good leaving group on an oxygen. Um, and the peroxide, in theory, you could probably do this with with like chlorate or something like that. If you had an oxygen that had a, chlor a chlorine attached to it, some, something that was also a good leaving group, um, this is just the standard way of doing it. Um, where we're not, you know, trying to reinvent in organic, organic chemistry. Um, once, so once we migrate the alkyl group over here, so for, our, for an alkene, or sorry, for an, an alkyne reacting, it's going to still be an alkene. Did I go right by it? I don't have the best angle to be able to read it. Acid catalyzed. And yeah, that's still. Yeah, okay. And then it's talking about tautomerization. There. But then it just talks about the tautomer. So it just says it's the same. So we'll go back to the other, the other figure. Um, the only difference between these two is really just going to be the that it's your R group has still has a pi bond. Um, but you're going to go through all the same steps. Just a tautomerization. At the end. And then there's a tautomerization at the end. And so then and again, we're not going to show three steps again once we get to this step where we can just show, okay, then we're just going to replace, we're going to have that hydroxide act as a nucleophile again and attach the boron and just kick off our, our hydrated um, R group. So now I'll go back to the So now once we're looking at that, it's just going to be, okay, there's my boron, there's my oxygen, there's my carbon, carbon, two more carbons. And we're going to make that tetrahedral intermediate where you've got the boron with four bonds for a minute. Um, it does occur in two steps. Um, And then, so then we'd have the R2, OH, and then our OR group. And that gives the negative charge on the boron. Then your oxygen just pulls the electrons with it and you wind up making This intermediate is our second to last in intermediate. Uh, we'll protonate that to make the tautom tautomer, the enol, and then go through the tautomerization to rearrange it. Which, if we if it doesn't say we're going to go back and do it under acidic conditions, we're doing this under basic conditions. We just have to remember our first step won't be a proton transfer to break that pi bond. The first step will be. Um, will be the OH group. So just clean this up. 
we're drawing the tautomerization. If it's base catalyzed, our first step is just going to be to, no, sorry, it's to, just to deprotonate um, the oxygen on the far side. And then when you have the oxygen with the negative, which is the intermediate I just erased and cleaned up to make the, the um, enol. You wind up with that rearranging, you make the aldehyde and you have a carbon ion for a second that, or just grabbing a hydrogen. We haven't really talked about carbon ions much. So I think the more standard way we do it at this point would just be the, to draw the, both of those happening at the same time instead of making a carbon ion intermediate. And that's going to give you your enol. So there's our acid catalyzed tautomerization. If it's acid catalyzed, you start by breaking the pi bond to protonate it, to put a positive charge next to the alcohol, which then makes this, and then you do one um, to make your, take that resonance structure and deprotonate it. We're just gonna switch the steps to, to do the base catalyzed. Right, so proton transfer first. And really, the first thing I did, the, this first step is just undoing what we did the step before. So I'm actually thinking, the more I think about this, I, the more I think that the tautomerization, I might just put that as a separate mechanism rather than having you tack it to the end of one of these other longer mechanisms, um, just so we don't need to worry about it. So I'll probably do that and explicitly call it out like, do this, this hydroboration ending at the enol, um, and then have you, have you do the rearrangement as a separate mechanism step, um, just because it would tend to get really, really long <laughs> otherwise. But just like we've talked about before with these mechanisms, have your landmarks, right? Okay. You know, Yes, ideally you'll be able to, to come up with every single arrow and have it memorized the whole time. But at the same time, as long as you know, okay, my first step is I need to put my carbon on the boron. And and I'm gonna, you know, then you can usually find a way to, to wiggle the electrons and hydrogens around to make that work. If you know what your goal is, okay, this is gonna take two steps, but my the end result is that an enol turns to an aldehyde. Um, given how many mechanisms we have and how many other classes y'all are taking, it probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense to spend hours upon hours memorizing where every single arrow goes for every mechanism we've looked at, right? <laughs> um, so, but where I was going with that before is we ended with, um, we did one last proton transfer step to make the enol to have that negatively charged oxygen pull a hydrogen from something else. And then the first step in the tautomerization, if it's under basic conditions, is to undo that. You wouldn't really need to show those two proton transfer steps if the first thing you're going to do here is to deprotonate it. And it started deprotonated two steps ago. You could skip that proton, um, proton transfer to just start from here and just say, okay, well, if, it, if I've got an oxygen with a negative charge next to a pi bond, it can do this um, resonance structure and then pull hydrogen from something else. 
So you just show your proton transfer step that way, you show it as a resonance structure and then a proton transfer step rather than proton transfer step to add the proton, proton transfer step to remove the proton and then draw your resonance structure and then draw your last proton transfer step. That's a little redundant, right? Um, when you could just start here to begin with. Um, and the other thing that I will do, I don't know why it's not like this on the practice test. Um, typically, I show you what product you're going towards with these mechanisms. I want you to th show the steps, um, but I'll give you what product where I want you to end. So if I ended, if I drew the, the enol, As your as your final product, you would just stop at the enol. If I drew it as the as the um, aldehyde, I would expect you to get all the way to the aldehyde, but that removes the ambiguity there. And just like with the with the um, Gen Chem tests and last quarter. They're gonna feel like a book when you get them because I'm gonna give you lots of white space. So don't be intimidated by the, the heft of the, of the test. It's mostly gonna be blank white space so that you don't feel cramped. Do my reps before the, right? Yeah. <laughs> And I'm, let's see, we've really covered like three chapters of material here, right? Four, if you count the synthesis as a chapter, but that was really just another way of looking at the stuff we had already done. We have three chapters that had mechanisms in them, alkenes, alkynes, and free radicals. That, since I'm going to be asking you about three mechanisms, I think you can kind of extrapolate that there's going to be one from each chapter. Um, and and I will say that if if it's a um, from the alkyne chapter, if it's a hydration one that's going to go through an enol tautomerization, I'll show it as two steps. I'll show you, you know, there'll be one A will be go from the alkyne to the enol, and one B will be go from the enol to the, um, to the carbonyl. Yeah, last mechanism problem. Since there's the double bond, like either side of it isn't more or less substituted, you would get um, the OH group adding to both of them, you get both products and one of them would have a rearrangement. Not really, because the rearrangement like yes, they're both the both the intermediates at first will be secondary carbocations, yeah. but because one of those secondary carbocations can get more stable, okay. that drives the equilibrium towards the side that allows for rearrangement. Okay, so you, um, yeah, kind of what I was thinking too, but then I start second guessing myself. Can maybe there be two products? So you'd only end up with the one product. I would be, yeah, and and again for the sake of. Um, of uh, removing ambiguity here, since I just tested you on 10 reactions where I'm just said do the major product for this one, I would specifically say, show the mechanism to get to oh, this product, product yeah. so that you don't yeah. need to worry about that. Yeah. Um, if you have competing mechanisms on a mechanism problem, at least for my tests, what I'm really looking for is pick the major product and show me that mechanism. So you don't have to do mechanisms. You don't have to then. do show competing mechanisms, exactly. So if that was just the uh, like the part two problem, um, the answer the answer I got was just OH on the, uh, for the methylist. Yes, okay. so you wind up with a, with a di, um, with a one methyl cyclohexanol. You also 
will probably notice. So again, sometimes I, I think it's helpful for me to explain my logic for how I write these tests so you can see what's going on here. Out of the three, there's going to be one, one mechanism from each of the three chapters, alkenes, alkynes, and free radicals. You also notice that there's a variety of levels of complexity. I'm not going to ask you the most complex mechanism for each of the three chapters. There'll be, this is the most complicated mechanism was here. This one was sort of kind of in the middle. Yeah, you had to remember that it, what NBS is and how to show that initiation and do the year initiation, but it was not as much writing as number one um, or as complicated. And then this one was a really straightforward one, right? Other than watching for the rearrangement, um, this is like a, you know, a three-step mechanism, including the rearrangement really, right? So that's a that's a quick and easy one. Then there was a middle of the road kind of complex one, and then there was a, a really complex one. That's probably going to look pretty similar as well. I'm not going to go balls to the wall on all three of them. Lex, is that a Bob's Burgers sticker on your on your yes. laptop too? Yes. <laughs> I haven't kept up, but I love H. John Benjamin, so I should probably go back and rewatch those. I've only seen like the first season, I think. Oh, yeah, it develops. Yes, yeah. like a different feel. First season just like feels a little more Yeah, it definitely did a little bit, but. Feels like it, they built on all the all the characters got more well developed. It seemed like and made it progressively stranger and stranger, like a little yeah. bit like South Park did a little like how they all had such shared history by the end of it. By the way, it's like every episode was weird. <laughs> yeah, I think the sticker is from a an episode where Bob gets like this membership. Um, like a, a community garden. Um, so he's like wants to grow his own food. But of course, like the the person that like runs the thing has a son that doesn't get along with the bees. So nice. <laughs> so, nice story. Yeah. I started watching the bear show too. Oh, yeah. The, yeah, it's a really good show. Yeah. We we tried once and Hulu kept crashing on us. And then so we started another show and we haven't gotten back to it yet. But that's next on our list. Yeah. Uh, now we finished that Last Kingdom show. Well, so thanks for that recommendation. It's good. <laughs> I'm very much sure about Hulu too much. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's our old fire stick that when Hulu puts yeah. a new update out and yeah. then it, it like, stresses crazy. out the memory and it just crashes for until no. they fix it. That's what is at my house too. Yeah. <laughs> My wife's convinced that they keep doing that on purpose to make you buy new fire sticks, so yeah. she won't do it. <laughs> All right. Anybody else have anything they want to work on specifically right now? Any questions about how I want anything shown? Or what does the um, the NBS? Um, and bromosuccinamide. Um, do you want us to, to show you like the whole structure? No, I think it's you can just call it an R group. Um, I won't have you memorize that. Just know that it's a bromine attached to an R group that that can go through an initiator step. The main thing to show is that that makes a bromine radical. You just do the homolytic cleavage. It does just does a homolytic cleavage. The only reason to use the NPS instead of just bromine and light is because if you have bromine around, then you're going to do a competing reaction because you have the bromine that can react with them to do a halogenation addition reaction. But if you have the NBS, so if you had
if you do this with NBS, we're going to put a bromine, we're going to do a hydrogen abstraction in the allylic position and then put the bromine radical, put a bromine there. If you did it with just Br2 and light, you'd get some of that, but you'd also get some of just bromine reacting across the double bond to do a bromine here and a bromine there. And so the way we get around that is to not have Br2 around. That'd be a non-radical reaction? That'd be the non-radical version, right? Um, so to avoid that, so that we don't wind up with these competing mechanisms, we minimize how much Br2 is around um, by using by generating our bromine radical from something that's not Br2. Pretty genius, actually. It's really very cool. clever. It's yeah. very clever. Like, oh, well, let's just not have bromine. Well, like stabilizes the radical. Yeah. Where people are and, and lots of people over lots of years, too. I mean, Radical reactions were first discovered and like they started to figure out how it was all working like back in the 1930s or so. Um, and then, you know, by the 1940s, you still had, you had your first like commercially available plastics, most of which were made with radical reactions, even if they didn't fully understand the mechanisms yet. But, and it was probably not until the 60s that they started seeing seeing some of these more clever ideas for, for using the radical reactions. In the in the 50s and 40s, all they did was just brute force polymers. Um, so, you know, don't don't feel too overwhelmed. It's it's 150 years of really smart people and a lot of them working at it to get to this point. Now they're just you have to get progressively more and more convoluted now because now everybody knows this. Yeah. So to be, to be that clever now yeah. is harder. Like push the bar so high. Yeah. Are there any like imaging technologies that show reactions happening or not yet? They're working on that. I think in the past few years, I've seen some headlines where they were able to do um I've seen claims that they were able to image transition states um, using electron microscopy and things like that, and only for very specific reactions. Um, but for the most part, if, it, if a reaction can happen on a surface, we have ways of imaging it using an electron microscopy. Um, we can usually see reactant, we can see the intermediate, we can see product, trying to image transition states is really, really hard because everything happens so quickly. Um, but they're getting there. And I we can't really do it with the gas phase at this point. We basically just have to say, well, we're 98, 99% sure this is the mechanism and we can calculate the energies to show that it, the rate constant should be what we measure it to be. Um, and even in solution, I don't even know if we had, we would have a way to image anything in solution. Really, our the only way we have of visualizing things that small is on a surface. But it's definitely still a lot of really interesting things happening in in especially in physical chemistry. Um, we consider that physical organic chemistry, studying the physics of organic reactions, um, which was my grad school work was on the computational side of that. All right, well, any other questions about the practice? Do you want to do some some the um, last page one while we're while we're here? Yeah. Okay. So again, this is showing you the mechanism so you can see that it's not just we're not I'm not just making this up. <laughs> um, but effectively, we just have the an alkanide ion that's going to act as a nucleophile. Um, and we haven't done carbonyl chemistry yet either, but what we'll see is carbonyls have a really good target for nucleophiles because you got a pretty strong partial positive on that carbon, right? So any nucleophile will do a similar reaction here. Um, but in this case, it's an, if it's acetylide coming in and attaching there, making this, actually we have a reduction reaction happening basically, where we go from, an, from a carbonyl and we end with an alcohol 
next to an alkyne. So if our net result is carbonyl plus acetylide adds two carbons next to or to the same carbon that has um, our hydroxide or our oxygen originally, what are our steps that we could do? Using only acetylene, how do we get here? So acetylene is two carbons, right? And we have an acetylide reacting with a carbonyl. We only have one reaction that way well, we have two reactions that make carbonyls, right? It's either got to be a hydration of a triple bond or ozonolysis, right? Because ozonolysis of a double bond gives us a carbonyl. So with that in mind, one of the places I would start here is, okay, well, how many carbons on, are on my target molecule? So if my target molecule looks like that, we've got five carbons on your target molecule, but your only source of acetylene is two carbons. Or so your only source of carbon is two carbons at a time. That tells you we're gonna have to add a bunch of carbons together and then chop it up somehow, right? So if we start with acetylene and we make and we build it up out of three acetylene molecules till we can have six carbons, if we can then, or actually since our, our new reaction is a acetylide reacting with the carbonyl to add two carbons, if we can put two acetylenes together to make a, um, something we could then chop up with ozonolysis and then bring in our last two carbons. So if we're starting backwards here, and I'm gonna switch this way. So if we're starting backwards, we've got our Well, before that, if we know that we're we're trying to use that new reaction we were just given, probably looking at something like this as our step right before that, right? Because we could take, if we could make this molecule, it's just doing a partial hydrogenation to get to the alkene, right? And this is the same setup as, um, that's the product from our new reaction that you were just shown right before, right? An alkyne directly attached to an OH group or a carbon with an OH group. So that means our two pieces to get there were acetylide and an aldehyde, right? So that part's easy to get to from acetylene and just excess sodium amide, right? So now the trick is how do we get to here? So we just cut off two reactions and now all of a sudden it's starting to look like a simpler molecule that's gonna be easier to reach, right? By working backward, it gives us that Um, that advantage there. So how are we going to get from acetylene, just acetylene, 
to this, well, this is three carbons, right? So again, probably gonna have to do some ozonolysis. What would what molecule would we have to start from if we were gonna try and do ozonolysis to end with the, the molecule that's circled on the right? What would that look like? Well, we could do hydration of an of an alkyne to get to a carbonyl, but if we did that, we'd still have to be, we that doesn't change our number of carbons, right? Which means we would still need to start with a carbon skeleton that was an even number. That's an odd number of carbons. So that's really the clue. The fact that we want three carbons and we can only get to odd numbers um, through reacting acetylenes together tells us we're gonna have to do some, some ozonolysis. So with that in mind, How does, how does ozonolysis work? The one that gives us a, a carbonyl rather than the carboxylic acid. It was a alkene or alkyne? Yes. So it's an alkene and we chop the alkene on both sides or on the, the pi bond, right? So I drew it in the wrong direction here. If we started from something that was four carbons, if we put that through ozonolysis, we'd get the molecule on the left, wouldn't we? So then the question is, okay, well now how do we get, how do we get here from acetylene? Well, we could put two acetylene, we could react acetylene. If we want, if we want and to put two carbons together, we needed we need a good target for a nucleophile and we good we need our acetylide, right? So if we could work that backwards. We could go from a triple bond to, to that one butene pretty easily, right? And if we were trying to add an acetylide to something to make it butyne, what would the other piece have to look like? A group with like an iodine halogen on it? Yeah. Or since we're used to using bromine, we could use bromine too. And this, this one is harder than a synthesis problem I would actually give you on a test because part this is the practice test. So you have the time to think about it. Um, so don't be overwhelmed by that. But so we had, now we have all of our, all of our steps that change the carbon structure, change the carbon skeleton are all only involving either chopping something up or carbons that we can make from acetylene, right? 
we added two carbons in the step that I just drew from the, the red going to the yellow, but that's a satellite, which is easy to make, and a two carbon fragment, which we could make from acetylene itself as well, right? So then the last piece to this is just, okay, what are the steps to get from acetylene to that bromoethane? And can we do that? The last thing, last steps that we would want to add to the front is how do we go from here to here? Yeah, we can, we're going to do a hydrogenation and a hydrobromination, right? We did a hydrobromination first. That's going to give us This molecule, right? And then if we did hydrogenation on platinum, that gives us our ethyl bromide. So, this is one that you almost, unless you're pretty experienced in this, you're not going to be able to just sit down and look at it and go straight starting at the beginning and work your way left to right. This one, you kind of have to work backward. Okay, well, this is weird. This doesn't look like anything, but I'm one step away from this new reaction I just learned. And then say, okay, well, then if I did this new reaction to get one step from my final product, what would the, the reactants have to look like to give me one step away? Now I'm two steps away from my final product, right? Going from here to the alkyne with the alcohol to the three carbon fragment that we have down here. Like that is, those are some big leaps. And again, this is sort of the wild card question that I don't expect people to necessarily get full credit on. But if you can get some of the steps, if you're working towards it, even if you're not able to say, um, you know, or you don't either don't have time or you're not able to get all of the details figured out in the middle, that's okay. Knowing more or less what your general pathway would be, it's a little bit like doing a complicated conversion from back in Gen Chem, right? Those were really hard at first and you needed those roadmaps to, and you could kind of work from both directions on those too, right? And then as we practiced with it more and more, you got to be able to see how those connections worked. That's how synthesis works too. I'm not sure is a connection I've ever actually made for my OCHEM students before because I've never taught been teaching conversions in another class the same time as we're covering this material. But with the weird South Tahoe high schedule, we're covering complicated conversions right now. And it's like, oh, it really is very, very similar. You start at the ends and work towards the middle. Just we're doing it not with conversion factors, but with reactions now. All right, how are we feeling? It's probably not the best one to end with to get your confidence up. I heard about that one. Um, a little bit of like guess and check sometimes. Like, what if I do this or what if I do Yeah, that? definitely. There's definitely an element to that. And there's definitely an element of, of like, well, there's only one reaction that I know that gets me to this. How, and so what did the pieces have to look like for that to happen? It also makes me think of like when you're, I remember being in, in fourth grade and just when I felt like I had a handle on, 
on my multiplication tables, they introduce long division. Yeah. <laughs> this is so much harder. That's like the same thing, right? You just got your handle on reactions. Yes. And now it's like, now do your reactions backwards. Yeah. It's, it's the same thing, though. It's the same material, just working it backwards. I get it from one of the synthesis problems you had from last lecture, but I thought we were going to go over the, the first one, maybe. Yeah. We didn't finalize going through those, did we? All right, so for the first one, again, when we're trying to, to figure this out, we can look at this one. This one's pretty easy to look at and say, you have to, we're going to have to count things up, but very obviously we're going to have to add some, some carbons, right? We've got a four carbon fragment on the left. We've got six carbons on the right. At least that's a nice even number. That means we don't need to use ozonolysis because we can, we know that we can add two carbons at a time just by doing that acetylide process, right? So to make, if we're trying to make, if we're pretty sure we're going to have an alkyne involved at some point, we're trying to end with a carbonyl, then one of those hydration reactions is going to, is a pretty good bet. Right, so what would, if we're trying to undo this, that last step, what would it look like before? Do we do terminal alkene and we do the um, oral hydration. One, two, three, four, five, six, R2, BH, followed by the oxidation step would give us one, two, three, four, five, six, with the aldehyde. Okay, so that's perfect. We know that we are gonna do that hydroboration to get our final product. Now it's a matter of, okay, how do we get from, how do we get from one butene to this molecule? Well, we had to add two carbons to do it, right? So we're going to do two carbons as an addition reaction or at, to, to change the carbon structure. We had to start with four carbons, including a good leaving group on the end carbon, because that's where we want to add our acetylide. And Our satellite. Those steps make sense where we were going with that. That gets us the right number of carbons. And then once we get the right number of carbons, we do a functional group transformation to turn that alkyne into carbonyl. We use the anti-Markovnikov. What did you need? Uh, two bromines to form an alkyne? A triple bond? No, because we're using, we're gonna do have the four carbon piece be the target. Target. Okay. Because acetylene is so easy to work with. We always have acetylene oh, around. Yeah. So we're gonna turn we're turning acetylene into our, our nucleophile okay. and make our four carbon fragment. We could do it the other way. You're right. We could take this um if it was dibromo, we could turn, but then we wind up with our double bond in the middle. See, that's where I got. And then I was like, oh, can you like pull that to a terminal alkene? And that's where you, you could. Okay. If, but that would be multiple steps, and we'd be relying on 
and you know, kind of going back and forth to move those pi bonds. That's gross. But if we just flipped it and we made this our nucleophile, then it's already a terminal alkyne. And this is a really easy step to get from one butene to one bromobutane. That's a one step anti Markovnikov addition, right? We know that one. And we'll see this frequently with synthesis problems. There are a lot of times, especially as we add more reactions in there, a lot of times there's going to be five different pathways you could take, but there's going to be one best pathway usually. Sometimes there's two that are about equal, but usually it's going to be like, well, I could take seven steps to get there, or I could take four steps to get there. Four steps is going to be almost always going to be better. It's at least simpler to write, if nothing else. When would be four steps better? If There's one of steps. those four steps is a really low yield or really toxic or something like that, um, seven steps can be better if all of those seven steps individually are higher yield together, right? It's pretty uncommon, though, right? Because you're very rarely are we getting above 90% yield for any of these steps. And um, we can, most of the reactions that we're learning right now are at least 70% addition. That one would be, we just do HBr in the presence of peroxides, right? That's our free radical hydrobromination gives us the anti-Markovnikov hydrobromination. Oh, um, for these synthesis problems, mm -hmm. do you, it's really like writing them out. Do you want these set, the set, the set of leads on, um, on the hour, on the reaction arrows? Yeah, you can, you, you can do that since we're using that as a reactant really commonly. If you wrote, although the other way that you can do it is, um, There it is. Sorry. Lost the screen. Too many screens going at once. Um, the other way you can do it is okay, if I've got my, if I manage to make my one bromobutane, you can also just have a separate reaction arrow. Like, so you have input coming from two different directions and converge. So that's come two together. paths coming together. Um, as, Especially if it's if it's something where we could just do it all in one step, that'd be one thing. But since we want the acetylene, and then we're going to say, oh, the acetylene plus excess NaNH2, that's, you know, again, I'm not going to be that picky about it since that's such a common step for us at this point. But that's probably the way that I would write it myself would be to show, have two arrows converging. Yeah, kind of did have the hydroboration where yeah. the, um where you're preparing that ion from the exactly exactly. Is that how you would do it? Um, like practically, but like you, we would probably do that in two different. Yeah, because we don't really want we don't really want to put sodium amide with this molecule if we can help it because the amide is a really strong nucleophile and, and it's also a really strong base. So we could actually just wind up undoing what we just did to make this and making the one butene again, or just adding a nitrogen here as a nucleophile instead of our acetylide. So when we would make the sodium acetylide first separately and then take the acetylide and add it here. If you tried to do it all in one pot, you would get a huge mess of all sorts of side reactions happening because this stuff is so nasty and so reactive. Plus, 
step to make this was under acidic conditions, and this is exceptionally basic. So you'd, you'd also wind up with just making ammonia and sodium bromide, because this would just take the hydrogen, any leftover hydrobromic acid is going to react with that even faster than it's going to react with any of the organic stuff. The sodium bromide fast years early. No, it's salt. It's, it's pretty standard, you know, it's like sodium chloride. Um, it's really non-reactive, which makes means it's really easy to make usually. Um, and so that's probably what would happen if we mixed all these things together, we're just gonna get a whole bunch of sodium bromide and everything stayed the way it was. I was kind of wondering the other day, um, the, like, you know, how you use like chlorine for pools mm -hmm. and decontaminate, is, there, is that like process related to anything to learning? With these kind of remember how I said that we could probably use a chlorate instead of the hydrogen peroxides because we could do you know a chlorine attached to an oxygen. The way we actually generate the we don't actually add chlorine gas. We generate or we add chlorates that that over time progressively break down to make low levels of chlorine gas. So we never actually have pure chlorine gas being added. Um, and that's, that's the reason why you use bromine in hot tubs and chlorine in pools is the difference in temperature because they both go through the same reaction more or less. Um, it's more reactive. One's more reactive at the higher temperature. So because if you put pool chlorine in a hot tub, that's a good way to shock the pool um, in terms of you'll make a whole bunch of chlorine real fast, which is you don't want to go swimming in it for a while. It'll kill everything. Yeah. Um, but you got to give it a little bit. But if you're trying to maintain a constant amount of low level, use bromates in hot tubs and you use chlorates in pools um, because they both have similar effects on, on living organisms. They both you know, kill the crap out of bacteria. Um, so it's kind of related. We could look at what those, and we can think about what those reactions do. We did talk about halogens and, and pi bonds, right? And since most, pretty much all cell membranes have our unsaturated fatty acid chains, those phospholipids are unsaturated, right? That's what keeps them like flexible, right? That yeah. keeps them flexible. If you if you brominate those or chlorinate those, you're all of a sudden it's not going to be able to maintain the same integrity for the cell membrane as well as a lot of other proteins wind up getting getting chlorinated and brominated as well and losing their function. Um, so you just wind up kind of like breaking all of the most important pieces. Um, yeah, this is good for hot tubs and pools. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and actually you see that if you've ever, if you've ever noticed how certain plastics, if you leave them in a hot tub, they'll get more brittle. A lot of times that's because you're actually chlorinating something in the plastics because the plastic material sometimes might be unsaturated and have bonds that will react with the chlorine and the bromine. So you get discoloration. That's what bleaching happens. Part of the bleaching, if you need to leave something in the sun, is, is that um, you break down those, those chromophores from the sunlight a lot of times through free radical reactions. But if you leave them in a hot tub, they do the same thing. Um, except it's just the bromine and the chlorine that wind up breaking it down instead of sunlight breaking it down. It, it is. It's, I think it is. You always know you gotta like put that stuff in the pool, but you never really know what's going on in there. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah and that's why you, that you, you shouldn't mix and match too. Um, you know, the, one of the very first things that I make sure all the gen chem students know when we start getting into labs is, Never mix cleaning products. I don't care what the you know TikTok influencers doing. Don't do that. Yeah. Uh, even Matt Gibson would, told me um, at the end of, of uh, class last year. He's like, "Yeah, I was trying to move out of my my place, and and I was like, and I forgot what you said. So I was using Windex, and it wasn't working. So I switched to using bleach, and then I got real woozy, and my throat hurt. <laughs> and even I've done it. I've done that too because yeah. you like you get frustrated, like I'm." Yeah. Pulling out the bleach because I'm sick of scrubbing. Yeah. Yeah. And then you, you know, have to give yourself a few minutes outside. <laughs> that form second nerve gas, basically, right? Or... It's there's so pretty much any 
cleaning products, when you mix them, are going to make something dangerous. Um, even like liquid plumber and Drano, yeah. same application even. One's super basic and one's super acidic though. Wow. And when and neutralization reactions are really exothermic. Yeah. So what happens is you wind up boiling the water in the pipe on top of the clog. And then when you look in to see what that noise is, it sprays right out. Um, or you wind up with the pipes bursting or melting. Um, and so that's that's not even, that's just a physical danger. That's not even a chemical danger really. Um, but, and you hear about it, if you watch the news, like once a year or so, someone, someone somewhere mixes the wrong things together and finds up either making chloramines or making chlorine or or killing themselves because they're, they had a stuck toilet. I didn't realize they were that different, like what's basic. What's... Yeah, so the, especially the powdery one, the powdered Drano is lye, is sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, depending on where you buy it. And liquid plumber is, um, concentrated sulfuric acid. Um, and so, and when you mix those together, it's really exothermic. Um, so works really, really well to clean your pipes though, especially <laughs> the, the, um, especially if you, if you have long hair or like, you know, you notice all the time there's hair in the drain and stuff like that. Um, make sure that you're not going to eat through your pipes. You don't have like copper pipes or anything. Um, but that the crystalline Drano stuff works really well because you just wind up breaking down all those proteins so, um, and just eating away, just pour it, dump it down the drain with a little bit of hot water and just leave it for a couple hours. Works really well. Yeah. Find different things oddly satisfying as you get older. Yeah. <laughs> ah, right. That drain drains so well now. <laughs> I remember when I first left for college, I was always looking forward to laundry. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's a laundry day. This is gonna be nice. <laughs> it's my nice break. <laughs> there is that. Some people, I that's dishes for me. I like yeah. doing dishes. Um, yeah, my first job was doing dishes in the chem lab, and I've always liked doing dishes. But laundry, laundry laundry's not nuts. <laughs> Can't pull of laundry. Yeah. Oh, I'm just glad we have technology. You just throw it in a giant machine and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Should we call it for the day? We don't really have any new material to go over. Is there any any last minute questions before you get started for the weekend? On yeah, uh, question about number ten, and it might have been brought up earlier, but with the liquid, uh, the dissolving metal reaction, the dissolving metal reaction. How yeah. does it react with an alkyne versus alkene? It makes an alkene. Okay. We don't really see. We don't really use right. that reaction for an alkene. We make an alkene. This is that's just the way we make a trans alkene. Um, because if we did that Lindler catalyst, the poison catalyst with hydrogen gas, we get um, the cis alkene. So this would just give us the trans version. It'll always stop at an alkene. Then it always stops at the alkene. Okay. And this is one we don't even know the mechanism for it fully. It's like a inorganic. It's not just we we know lots of inorganic. But it's just for whatever reason this is one. It's probably goes through something. So sodium has one electron to give, right? Um, so it probably goes through some sort of weird free radical mechanism, but in a way that's not what we would expect normally. And so I've, I've tried to look into it. There's not even a whole lot of papers that have been able to be published on like suggesting mechanisms for it. Um, we know it works though. Yeah. Opium is also a weird mixture of, we can explain this pretty well, and this is just guess and check. Yeah, it's just follow along. Should be different in 50 years. It'll be right, different exactly. Yeah. 